Hi, everybody. Welcome along to episode 86 of Percussion Discussion. As usual, please check out our social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, our world famous YouTube channel, where you can see and hear all of our conversations, past and present. If you wouldn't mind subscribing, then uh, that would be really helpful. Um, it only takes a second, so that would be amazing if you could do that. If you prefer to listen on the go, then you can find all of our conversations in podcast form. They're to free to download from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all of your usual podcast providers. So if that's your thing, you know what to do. And if you can leave us a very short review, that would help even more. So if you don't mind, thank you very much. On to today's guest, uh, a remarkable drummer. Um, an American drummer living in Italy, and he's played with some amazing bands such as uh, TNT. He's played drums for Ingrid Malmsteen, um, uh, Power Mad, back in his early days in, on the, uh, the thrash speed metal thing. He had his own incredible progressive metal band, Ark, uh, and he's just played on two amazing Michael Romeo albums. Um, a, a, an astonishingly good player and a really nice guy to boot. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Mr. John Macaluso. John, thanks so much for doing this, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very psyched. Oh, I'm a, a good company I'm going to have. You've got some of the big, big, biggest drummers in the world coming on. We'd be, I've been lucky, you know, and hopefully guys like yourself are going to keep coming and, uh, you know, people keep watching and listening and learning, hopefully. Um, yeah, time. we're doing all right. We're doing okay. Well, look, I appreciate it. Now, it, and I also appreciate it's uh, it's ten o'clock in the evening for you. You're you're in Italy, aren't you? Now you live in Italy. I'm living. Yeah, I'm from New York, but I live in Italy now. So it's ten here. Just yeah. got finished dinner. The funny thing is, everybody here they start eating at eight o'clock. It's right. perfect for me, man. Yeah, like dinner is at eight o'clock. So I don't know. I stay up really late, so this is like perfect time for me, man. And a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Where, whereabouts in Italy are you? I'm the direct center. They call it the, the belly button of Italy. If you land in Rome, you look at the mountains and you drive up. I'm up in the mountains. It's like 45 minutes from Rome. But with chariot, it's probably like an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. anyway. Beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Very different to New York, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I'm, I'm an Italian-American, so, the, you know, I'm kind of with my grandmother. I was very, you know connected with the customs so i lived all over europe i was talking to before yeah but uh italy for me is like the one place it seems like new york more than any other place like home it seems a little more homey here yeah you know Absolutely. but um i was telling you man i lived in surrey guildford for a while yeah, yeah. in 1993 and uh yeah i mean it was always like a, a, a place i heard of because I clapped and lived there I think Keith Moon had the house there Tara so to me it was like this legendary place and uh I loved it I was there for like six months really cool place then yeah. it is it's a good part of the world you know it, it's there's, there's so much history especially with music over here in the UK isn't there it's, it's the it's best good. it's the best I mean I don't know what you guys did what was in the water but it's, it's, it's I was talking to someone the other day you know a bass player named Wayne Banks I know the name I know it's unbelievable. Name. He played with, um, uh, he'd done metal gigs, but he also played with Barry Gibb for years. Like oh, the right. BG. <laughs> and I was talking to him the other day. I'm like, man, because I was touring with him. I said, what happened in England that it's just the best music ever came from there? And that's undoubted, man. You know, it's uh, all my favorite music was from England. And yeah. 1976 was the biggest year for music for me. Like the best music ever, 76. Whoa. What are we talking? Are we talking kind of rainbow we're talking more like Genesis and oh right, yeah, okay. you know yes, and uh, I think Genesis put out Wind and Weathering and Trick of the Tail that one year. Right, think of about course, it. that's of course we're getting we're getting the prog um, influences here early on, aren't we? Yeah, I always say, what's the matter with those prog guys? They can't count to four. <laughs> <laughs> Too clever for their own good, you know. <laughs> Unbelievable! <laughs> Unbelievable! Well, look, it, as I say, it's great to have you here, and and and, Thank I, you, bro. and I appreciate it. I'm always happy to talk drums, you know. So, uh, what's the talk too. music? It's 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 a great thing. So. Um, Let's go back to the beginning, if you don't mind, John. Where, where did it kind of catch fire for you? I mean, I mean, drums aside, what was your first kind of memories of music, if you like? Um, yeah, there was a, you know, JC Penny. They used to have a, a catalog. It was like a, a store. 
And I remember I was flipping through the magazine. I was looking at the bra ads. Of course. And then I, I flipped and uh, I flipped the page and I saw a guitar. And it was like, um, you know, like a, it was called a Hondo 2 or something like that. A real cheap guitar. And uh, it was like a Jimmy Page looking guitar. It looked like Les Paul Sunburst. Yeah. I was like, I want to play guitar. I don't know. I wanted to play guitar. So we went looking for a guitar. We bought a guitar for like, um, no, on the way... We were driving to go buy a guitar. There was a garage sale, and I picked up this guitar for like 20 bucks. And they gave me this little thing they called a pitch pipe. And the guy said, This is the way you have to tune it. Yeah. Went back for about a week and a half. I was like, It was like torture. I couldn't tune it. I couldn't play it. I had to, I had to physically put my finger, you know, like this. I'm a big Who fan. It's my favorite band. So, really, I took this guitar and I smashed it in the street. Like like uh, Townsend, bam! Right. Later on, I found out it was called a Vox Meteor, and now it's like a legendary guitar. Yeah, it's like I don't know how many thousands, but yeah. So guitar was done, and in my name, <laughs> if you guitar was done, that's one of those. <laughs> yeah, guitar guitar was done in a week, and then I, again, I said, "What can I do? I want to play something." So the movie Tommy was out. Mm. And I remember, I remember Keith kicking over that orange uh, premiere drum set. Yeah. I was like, that's what I want to do. So oddly enough, at a garage sale again, I found like a three-piece orange sparkled drum set, like a cheap thing, Microsonic it was called. Yeah. Brought it home. And from that day on, I quit wrestling. I quit baseball. I quit everything, all sports. And I just played. Boom. And a funny thing is, every drum set since then, or most, were always orange. Because Keith influenced me that much, Keith Moon. And, um, you know, a little fun fact. But um, basically, that was it. And I was lucky enough to grow up in New York, where they had a, a drum store, where a lot of famous drummers would come in. They always had drum clinics. This is like 1979. So even back then, they were doing clinics and stuff. Yeah. And um, I grew up in Long Island, which was cool, because everybody had a basement. It sounds stupid, but you can practice in a basement. When you go into Queens, Brooklyn, New York City, they don't have a basement. Right. Okay. So a lot of the Long Island guys were always, you know, practicing and getting their chops like crazy. And always Italian-American drummers in New York, you know, Joe Franco, Bobby Rondinelli, all of them. But uh, that's pretty much how I started, 1979. My first lesson was August 1979, August 7th. Wow, and, uh, you, you really remember it all. That's oh, that. I remember everything, man. Yeah, I, I also write down a lot of stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah I was going to say, you because you'd struggle to remember that if you didn't write that down. And <laughs> I mean, Yeah, I mean, man. The fact that you wrote it down shows great foresight because that, to me, tells, tells us that you're going to do this. This is going to be what you do. You know, the fact that you've written that date down. Exactly. I don't know about England, but in, uh, in America, I have a thing called the Guidance Council. And in 11th grade, you go into school, you graduate in 12th grade, hopefully. Yeah. But uh, in 11th grade, the year before your final year, you go and talk to this guy who you don't know, and they call him a guidance counselor. And I remember his, it was a Greek guy called Mr. Yakos. And he said, John, what do you want to do? He had an accent. What do you want to do for the rest of your life? And I was like, I want to rock. You know, I want to play drums. <laughs> and he was like, John, let's get serious. That's impossible. Nobody could really do it for life. You need something to fall back on. I think it was that speech which made me never learn anything else and yeah. just go for it. I said, I'm going to play. And that's it. The end of the story. Because he he kind of he doubted me. You know what I mean? So I said, no, I'm going to do it. Other people do it. I'm going to do it. So pretty much I always went. Doo, 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 doo. If I had a backup, I probably would have been playing by now. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I, I love that kind of determination. That's yeah, that's yeah. It. You know, and the more somebody tells you you can't do it, then it. You know, you dig in even more, don't you? Big time, big time. Uh, so you were, you were having lessons, and I guess you're doing the usual thing, playing along with albums, and you know. Yep, playing along with records, and um, I learned something way back when. If you really want to learn a song, don't play along to the album. If you just get it, you got to sit and listen first. Hmm. And um, I used to sit if I really wanted to learn like a Rush song or a Zappa song, I would just sit like I am now and play on my knees. Yeah. Yeah. And then I would get the licks down or try to get them, then physically go on the kit. Yeah. And it's funny because when I got, you know, I'm working with World Entertainment now, yeah. Gunther and Alex Ford. When I got the call to do the Symphony X gig, because Jason got sick, yeah. 
in like two weeks, I had to learn crazy, crazy long songs. And I said, this is a prog band. I'm not going to read on stage. It looks yeah. unprepared. It looks too nerdy. I'm not going to have a you know music stand. So I got the call from Mike Romeo and he said, hey, man, can you do this tour? You know, we really got to get someone. If not, we're going to cancel. I said, of course I could do it. He goes, you sure? I said, yeah, send me the stuff. Right. I only heard one Symphony X song in my life at the yeah. time. He goes, if you can't do it, I'm going to kick your ass. I said, send it on, man. The first song was a song called Inferno. It really physically, it, it took me one day to really get comfortable with the verse. Don't wow. I had two weeks. I'm going, oh my God, I'm dead. But I didn't go on the drums. I didn't have a drum set at the time in Europe because I just moved over here. So I had to play on my knees for like a week. And then the next week I went and I rented a little studio and uh, I started to practice the stuff. But if I didn't, I have a system if I really have questions with something and I want to, I don't want to read on stage. Hmm. I call it rhythm safari where every, every rhythm is connected with an animal. I'll be like alligator, alligator, bat, tiger, bat, elephant, elephant, shh, bat, shh, is like the snake. It's a yeah. So I'll, fi- I'll really draw a tiger or I'll write, <laughs> I'll write the word fill. P-H-I-L, Phil Collins. So I know that rhythm is always going to be da 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 you know, So little things like that helped me through the gig. I had tigers and, and, and words. Copeland was written there. That means go to a side stick. Oh, and okay, I, got, right. yeah, I got through it. But I mean, it, these things really help students. I try to teach my students. I go, you gotta have, you got to have code words. And, you know, it's not only about reading. The battlefield is the stage. Yeah. You know, so you, you never know what's going to happen. So just prepare yourself. You might write a whole shot and then you, there's not a light on the drama. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So anyway, yeah. So basically, like, um, I uh, took a lot of drum lessons. Joe Franco, Don Famielaro, Rod Morgenstein. Like, all these guys came wow, into awesome. our town. Because I know um, I know Dom, Dom is, uh, is Long Island, isn't he? I know he's, he's still in Long Island. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dom. Dom, uh, our first teacher was Jim Holland. Amazing. Mm. Al Miller. And then I went to PIT, uh, where I studied with Ralph Humphrey from Zappa and Casey Shirell. So that was an amazing school because unlike the colleges, it's funny. I don't know how old you are. I don't know how old you are, but I'm 54. I'm 48. Okay. At 54, okay, 54 years old. They used to say, if you didn't make anything by 25 in the music business, you're a goner. You're getting too old. So get a new career. 25 now is like, you know, people are still living home. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, the good thing about PIT was it was a one-year school, and it was kind of like, learn the stuff and go out and play. Yeah. You don't have to go to English class and do all these extra things like a college. And I was positive at the time because everybody had to go out and try to make a living out of it, you know? So um, that's where it was. So basically, after PIT, I just started – I got lucky enough that um, I had Joe Franco – we're My talking mentor. Joe Franco, who who replaced AJ Perro in Twisted Sisters. Yeah, Is this the same? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Joe Franco. Great. He he wrote double bass drumming, the, the, yeah. the number one. Uh, great. Him, or, I, unbelievable. He was my hero when I was a kid because this band called the Good Rats. I was a big fan of. And uh, but Joe Joe got me a lot of the gigs. Like if Joe couldn't do a gig, he would call me. TNT, Malmsteen, a lot of the gigs. Um, oh. he recommended me for. Thank God, because I might have still been home in Long Island. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> you know, you, you, you mentioned TNT. Now, I, I bought, uh, as a younger gentleman, when I had hair, long hair, uh, I bought uh, the TNT album that you did. And I had, and I listened to it religiously. Oh, really? And I had no idea it's the most un-Norwegian sounding band ever. Big time, big time. When, when they said we're from Norway, I was like... <laughs> is that that place next to Sweden? Like, I didn't even really know where it was. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah you're right. You're right. I, mean, I, I, I used to love, and I still do, Mother Warned Me. And, and I always ah. thought, it's, it's Motley Crue. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like Motley Crue. It doesn't it's, sound- it's, it's funny because, like, the band was very polished. And, um, you know, European guitar sound with a, with, a, with a metal American singer, you know. Mm. But they got a new producer on the album I did. Mm. And he did Mariah Carey at the time, which was huge. And... Pretty much, he kept saying, I want to make it streety. English guy named Rick Wake. I want to make it streety. So they wanted to change everything. They didn't want it polished. 
Yeah. It's where I really learned to play backbeat. They were like, pull it way behind the click. Yeah. It's not easy to do. No. They wanted they wanted everything like really lazy almost. And I was on fire. I didn't want that. I wanted to play on the click. But um that I think a mixture of the producer, the sound, and playing back, that's why it's very definitely un-European. Yeah. It's a great, <laughs> it's a great album though. And um realized fantasies the album exactly yeah, if yeah. anybody's unsure what we're talking about but you know it, it, it's it is a great sounding album with some great songs i mean that was right up my street that and, and but it just didn't sound european in any shape or form yeah exactly exactly they wanted it that way like i i, I love the first tnt i was i i used to listen in, when i was living in california driving to school uh ten thousand lovers was always on <laughs> and everyone's a star you know but when I got into the band, I was like, no, no, we want something different. So mm. anyway, yeah, that started a lot for me too. So I, I, so, I yeah. mean, how did that, obviously, were they, were they based in, in Norway? Was that, were they still working from there or were they in, in, in Yeah, two, two, two guys were Norwegian, a guitarist and a bass player and yeah. a singer, and the, three guys and the drummer, which yeah. is actually the coolest guy in the band. The yeah. drummer I still talk to today. Um, and then the singer was from California. Mm. So they got together and um, uh, yeah, I mean, the strange thing is they did the demos for the, for the album I did in Long Island because the, ah. the um, yeah, the co-songwriter was living in Long Island. So it's a weird situation. I said to say, what's TNT doing in Long Island? But uh, dude, three and a half years in a band, they still never asked me to join. Strange, <laughs> strange. What a good album. I Thank mean, I, I've jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, uh, you've played so many different styles over the, the years. I mean, and, and, and there's an album I, I remember the band. I didn't realize you'd play from, and that's Power Mad. Power Mad, of course. Which of course. is a totally different thing. Again, we're, we're kind of in the Anthrax sort of Testament Exodus sort of uh, vein here, aren't we? You know, 1988, man. It's a crazy yeah. story. I'll tell you that one if you've got if we got some time. I'll make it quick because yeah. it's an interesting story for drummers. After PIT, I went home. I was living with my parents, of course, because mm -hmm. I was a drummer. And yeah. uh, <laughs> I was downstairs playing pool with my father. And my mother called and said, hey, John, somebody from Warner Brothers Records is on the phone. I get upstairs. I'm like, I think it's my friends joking around. Yeah. No, there's a guy from Warner Brothers. And he goes, hey, man, we're in a desperate situation. We're recording with a band called, from Minnesota and they're called Power Med. They're on Warner Brothers. We're in uh, the record plant, New York City. We're recording now. We need you. Uh, can you do it tomorrow? But we want to see you play first. They were in New York City. I said, come on, here's my address. They drove out. They got to my house like 11 at night. They said, play. Give us some wailing double bass. Wailing double bass. I'll never forget it. So my neighbors were freaking because it was like 1130, you know. <laughs> so the producer, Tim Bomba, he goes, OK, you're in. Come on, let's go. So I'm like, great. I'm recording an album tomorrow. And at the time, it was before Pro Tools. You had to play from the beginning oh. of the song to the end. I never heard the songs yet, right? <laughs> so they give me a tape. I'm learning it on the way to the recording session. I get in there, record plant. Steve Gadd's drums are in the corner. Whoa. Packed up in boxes. So that's, that made me shake to begin with, right? I write myself a chart. I'm listening to the stuff. And it's metal. But I mean, I got to play from beginning to end. So I'm writing charts and stuff. I'm like, thank God I went to school. And then this dude comes in the room, long haired dude, tattoos, and he goes, hey, my name's Adrian. Who are you? Oh, I'm the drummer. I'm going to guide you what to play. <laughs> oh, so what happened was basically they had a band, they got a record deal. They went into the studio and the drummer couldn't cut it. Oh, so right. now they got a studio musician, but he's going to be there with me telling me what to do. So he's oh, showing yeah. me Phil's dude. It was for the first like five Five days was a nightmare. You got to play through, but then after he would go, "Oh, you missed that fill." I'm like, "Dude, I just played ten minutes straight, you know." And everything was like, dug -a -dug -a -dug -a -dug -a. "Yeah." It was coming out really good. So afterwards, after five or six days, the producer was like, "Yo, man, go get a hamburger. I'm gonna work for John." And they kind of let me do my thing more. So afterwards, they actually called me for the tour. I'm like, "Why didn't you let me do my thing in the studio?" You know. And um, then we got that David Lynch movie. We got a call to um. Uh, David Lynch was done with the movie Wild at Heart, mm. Nicolas Cage, Laura Dern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he loved this song called Slaughterhouse so much, but he actually wrote us into the movie. So we all flew to California and we filmed um, the movie Wild at Heart. We played part of Slaughterhouse when Nicolas Cage is dancing. We're right. dancing. Yeah. And then we did the Elvis song. So 
At Power Man, yeah, man. I was like 1989. Jeez. My God. Yeah. And, and, I mean, how did you, you, I assume you were playing like metal stuff before it to have the, the, the double bass chops to be able to cut it. So did you already have the, the, like the double bass chops going? Was that, was that something you were doing a lot of? Yeah, I was like a hyper kid. And then I started with Franco, Joe Franco. And Franco has a system where everything becomes easy. So besides, digga, 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 when you start to get the complicated rhythms at the time, digga, 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 I call it Morse code. Yeah. The Joe Franco system shows you left foot is offbeat, right foot is downbeat. And okay. you might know this, but at the time, most drummers were doing the Carmine way or the John Bonham thing where your left foot is the downbeat because you were using the floor tom as, a, as the other bass drum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now you got to switch the whole thing around. Right foot is down, left foot is off. Now it's, it's a known method, but at the time, most of the people, I think Tommy Lee too, you can hear it on Red Hot. He's leading with the left, yeah, yeah, I yeah. think, I think. Right. But I mean, uh, so that system really helped me um, to, to, to do stuff like Power Med and everything. Sure. Um, yeah, but I mean, uh, in those days, it was a lot harder than recording today. Today, you don't even have to write a chart. Just listen and you play the chorus and you say, okay, let's uh, stop and I'll do the next chorus, you know? Do you know, I mean, that's all well and good and it makes it easier for everybody, but don't you think the old way kind of set, sets the men from Eight the boys time. apart, you know? They, Eight they, time. They'd be, without Pro Tools, there'd be um, a lot less drummers working around, wouldn't they, you know? I always say, you'd be at the time I recorded Power Med, if you had Pro Tools, you'd be burned as a witch. They yeah. would say, Sack, what is this thing? They would burn you for being a witch because yeah. it was impossible. Yeah. But there's something beautiful about doing it beginning to end because one, the band has to rehearse. Yeah, you know, and uh, work out the kinks. And two, there's an energy that you can't really get from stopping and going to the next. Because a lot of guys now they're um, recording a chorus and then they'll paste the chorus and just change the fill. To me, the whole thing's cheating. But I mean, you got to roll with it. <laughs> you told, you won, yeah, of course you have. But you couldn't you couldn't fake it back in the day, could you? There was no, no way. way. You know, if you want to hear what somebody played, like you'd listen to that album and go, yeah, that's, that's, that's him playing. That's, that's how he sounds. Um, I was touring with Jennifer Batten in Brazil and in the festival was Billy Cobble. Yeah. So in the hotel, I walked down one day and it's Billy Cobble and he knew Jennifer. We all hang out for a minute. He goes, you want to go to lunch? I said, let's go. So I'm out to lunch with Billy Cobble and he's talking about, Mahavishnu Orchestra and all these things. And I said, Billy, can I ask you something? What made you play lefty on a hi-hat? He goes, there was no video. I didn't know you were not supposed to play lefty. I said, I can't believe that. Changing history. He said, yeah, we listened to Buddy Rich on the radio and I was playing jazz right lefty. Nobody told me it was wrong because what it didn't make sense to do this. I said, that's brilliant, man. History. You don't think about no. You know, yeah, there's no YouTube. Uh, no, exactly. Exactly. Ah, oh, I love it. And then, yeah. obviously, the, the, your, and I think when I spoke to you via email, I, I mentioned Ark. And, oh, and, and you said, baby. that's my baby. And, and I, um, I'm not too familiar with the first album, with the debut album, unfortunately. Yeah. But Burn the Sun, I am very familiar with. Wow. How did that, how did that come about? Because it's frustration, oh. frustration. Yeah. A kid on fire that took a million drum lessons and I was ready to do it. And I, I was lucky enough to get good gigs, popular bands, TNT riot, but I was never doing my thing. Yeah. I wanted to express myself. I didn't just want to play grooves. I loved it, but I wanted to start doing something, man. And I was always the new guy. Yeah. Jumping into a band, you know, Power Man, TNT, Riot, blah, blah, blah. Always the new guy. And you got to play the stuff the guy did on the other albums. That's all cool. But I was young and I wanted to really rip it up. And uh, I was so frustrated with like the TNT years. It was a great, it was great music. But as a band, we didn't get along and blah, blah, blah. And all that like energy. Um, I said, I got to do my own thing. So the strange thing is the TNT rehearsal place, we borrowed um, a rehearsal studio from a band called Conception. Mm -hmm. And the guitar player is the arc guitar player now, um, a guy named Tor Ospi. Mm -hmm. So we would hang out, it was their rehearsal place, and they would leave and TNT borrowed it before we did the Japan tour. Okay. And the guy 
um, the guitarist and me, he would stay till after our rehearsal or he would meet me and we would go on stage and jam, you know, kind of Al type type stuff. Right. He used to bring, he played a lot of flamenco guitar yeah. and I would play double bass with it. And uh, the first song we ever played was Race with the Devil on a Spanish Highway. Wow. So the, the, the style of Auk came out um, in this rehearsal space after both our bands rehearsed. It was flamenco guitar and like split rhythm, double bass and not always putting a backbeat. A lot of times I wouldn't use snare drum backbeat. Just like digga 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 digga. Very unconventional. Exactly. I wanted to do stuff that didn't have bop, bop. <laughs> you know, I loved it, but I wanted to make grooves because I said it's just rhythm. Yeah. Being a Stuart Copeland fan, sometimes it was only do, 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 do. So that's how we started off. I, I quit TNT and then I did Riot for a while. And then I flew back to Norway because I knew where it was now. Yeah. And uh, we, me and him wrote the first album in the same gymnasium in a school. <laughs> we recorded a demo on half inch tape. We went out to buy a record. I was looking for a Peter Gabriel record. And there was a record company dude in the record store who signed us on the spot. So we're the only band to get a record deal in a record store. Oh, then he, we, gave him a, we gave him a thing. He called us that night. He said he wants to release that. I said, it's a demo. No, I want to release that. So he released the actual demo. But from oh, that, we got a real oh, record deal. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, and the crazy thing is what we wanted to remaster, the dude's band went over the tapes because they couldn't <laughs> afford to buy a new one. So <laughs> that's rock and roll. We don't, we didn't have the masters anymore. Yeah. And then we did burn the sun and burn the sun oh. was like, that was my baby. It was like really writing the stuff and co-writing all the lyrics and yeah. all the music. And there was no rules, you know, that, there was no rules at all. That is your 1976 you were talking about earlier on. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's really? it. And dude, you're in the stuff. I'm sure you've been in the studio many times with a producer. The dude was a very respected and great producer, Tommy Newton. So the first song is called Heal the Waters. Oh, I, yes. I, I, I tried it once and I said, um, let me try let me try one more time. I, I expected to spend the whole day doing it. Like, let me try another take. I want to do a different intro. The intro was unplanned and it became my thing. Hmm. It's like Phil Collins said the same about his big Phil. So I did the intro. I loved it. I played through the whole thing. And there was some spots I wanted to redo, but that was impossible in those days. And the producer said, that's it. Go home. We're going to record another song tomorrow. I said, no, no, no. Let me try it again. He goes, no. I said, no, let me do it again. I don't like it. No, no, no. I want to do it again. No. He goes, go home. I pull rank on you. I went back to the hotel. I really didn't like it. I don't know why. I felt like it's much better, but now I love it. So that's a good producer. Oh, so, he, he said the energy yeah. is there. Yeah. He got he got his way, and you didn't get to do it again. Exactly. And maybe well, it would have been too perfect or something. I don't know, but it, he did the right thing, I think. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but a great what a great opening song, isn't it? And you know, a Thanks, great bro. great opening, Phil. Great. Dr forget drum sounds. Drum sounds amazing. But the whole album. I mean, your Yorn's vocals are just phenomenal. Dude, the way we did that was crazy. For one, I used Tommy Old with this real snap. Oh, really? Yeah, I actually took some lessons with him, but but this is way back. Tommy Newton, the producer, owned Tommy's snare drum. Right. And it was like a steel Yamaha, but I think it was like seven deep. Mm -hmm. So it was very hard to place on my kit, I remember, mm -hmm. but it sounded awesome. So it's Tommy's snare, and then on the Jungle Drum and Bass song, Absolute Zero, it was like a David Garibaldi piccolo. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, we switched drum kits. We used the Premier Signia. And a song called Missing You, we used the Signia, but on the heavy Bonham part, we actually used like the old Maple John Bonham kit he had with the 26 inch kick. And we didn't sample because that didn't exist in those days. What we did, it was all live drums in a gigantic studio. But the guy, the producer was brilliant. He put on these little um, uh, D drum triggers oh, yeah, and he, yeah. called it, he called it lipstick. He said he wants to get that. So he put 10% of what he called lipstick, 10% of that D drum trigger on top of my sound and it had that attack. Yeah. It was brilliant, man. So, wow. you know, Nick. I, I love hearing about stuff like this. And, and, and I, I have to say, I didn't realize, Signia drums are among my favorite drums ever. I've owned Amazing. five Signia kits now over the years. Really? They are, yeah, they are the best sounding things. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this, I think we're the, we're the three stupidest guys in the world because we should have kept that band going. Oh. Like, 
I toured with Joe Lynn Turner from Rainbow. And wow. Joe Lynn Turner would say that uh, Ark was uh, Ark was ACDC playing Prague because it was a it was a rock band that had something different. So when it's different, they call it Prague. And it was some time changes. But we also lived like a lifestyle like ACDC because most of us came from the Mounts team band. So yeah. it wasn't it wasn't like Friday night video game wars with us, yeah. like a Prague band, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think if we stayed together, it would have been a, a pretty big band, but we didn't. Yeah. Did you? Did you tour much with Ark, or was it was it mainly recording and? Well, after Burn the Sun, we we toured and it was amazing because like the first show in France, it was a big club called the Lycée Montmartre. I think it burned down now, and uh, we sold it out. And France is a hard market to break. I mean, we did like a record signing and an acoustic trio in Tower Records in Paris. It was packed. There was like ten year olds. There was fifty year olds. There was grandmas. Mm. Like we had we had this no age limit thing. Mm. And uh, well, so we did the tour and most of us were from New York and in, in Prague, we saw World Trade Center fall down, oh. 9-11, yeah. as we're on tour. And the promoter wanted to cancel because he was too paranoid to bring Americans around some places in Europe. And we were like, no, we got to go. We got to play, man. But uh, so the tour, basically, we did about three quarters of it. Yeah. Then we went back and we did Prague Power. And then... um. The band started to fight over stupid shit, like always happens. And we broke up, we got back together, we broke up, we got back together. And it just never got back off the ground. We never did that third album. Yeah, yeah. You know, but, it's uh, a shame because, I mean, just, well, anybody who hasn't checked it out, check check out, you know, it's, Burn the Sun is just such a, it's been on repeat. In my uh, in my van for I don't know how many weeks and, and oh beautiful oh. well there's some good news Maddie there's some good news and it's like a secret I hate these secrets and not being able to announce it but there's arc news coming oh there's big arc news coming yeah it's yeah. not a new album it's not a third album it's not a reunion but it's any arc people this is big news so oh, hopefully well, we'll soon see. enough. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I'm, I'm really happy about it. When it's I'm released, excited. maybe we'll get you back on and we can talk about it, whatever it is, so. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in, any time with you, man. You seem very cool, you seem very cool. No, oh, uh, thank you, likewise. Now, uh, yeah, obviously, yeah. We, we've mentioned uh, Malmsteen, anyway, Malmsteen. Um, ah. One of, <laughs> one of he's, uh, the guy, and I hope you don't mind me saying, he's had, more, say more, he's had more drummers than Spinal Tap, let's be honest. <laughs> about uh, but you, you're lucky enough, I think lucky enough to, to have been one of them. Exactly. Like, um, I came in after Cozy Powell. Think of that. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. it was, uh, and Tommy Aldridge, Tommy Aldridge was before that, I think. Tommy. Or Mike Toronto. Tommy, sure. Tommy didn't record though. Did, Tommy tore No, it. he did a tour. Yeah. Mike Toronto. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mike Toronto. So imagine this, man. I get a phone call again. But this time I'm living in Queens and um, Queens, New York. I answer the phone and I hear, John? I say, yeah, this is Ingrid J. Malmsteen. It sounded like a pirate. It sounded like a pirate on the other line. No, he, he put in the J. And I was cracking up. I go, oh, you mean Ingrid? How you doing? Ingrid Malmsteen. Ingrid J. Malmsteen. Yes. He goes, uh, Ark. He goes, I got this Ark album and I'm listening to a song called Where the Winds Blow. Is it you playing? I said, of course it's me playing. Because I got to go back in time. A year before, a guy from a guitar magazine called me and he gave me Ingve's number. Mm -hmm. He said, Ingve, uh, heard you played in TNT and some other bands and he may be interested in auditioning you. Here's his number. Or I think he gave him my number. He probably didn't give me Ingve's number. I think Ingve called. And he said, send him a video. I sent them a video of TNT Live in Japan. He called me back. He said, yeah, the drumming's really good. But do you twirl? I said, twirl. I said, twirl. You mean my stick? He goes, yes. I said, uh, it doesn't sound good. And he goes, that's not funny. Like it pissed, it pissed them off. It doesn't sound good twirling. I thought it was a funny joke. And, and, the, and the whole vibe just went south. And, and, and we ended up like hanging up and nothing happened with it. So I think he remembered my name because when he called me this time, he was like, is it you playing? I said, yeah, it's me playing. And it was quick. He goes, I'm going to put you on the phone with my manager. Or I'm going to have my manager call. Um, can you fly to Florida the day after tomorrow? Start recording my new album. I said, okay, cool. Manager calls me. I'm on a plane. 
boom, I land. Uh, we go to the we go to his rehearsal studio. We're hanging out for a while. He goes, "Come on, we go in his Ferrari. We drive like right up the block. Go to a bar, start drinking for like ten hours." I'm going. This gig is fun. And then he goes, "Let's go back to the studio and jam." Oh, jam! I can't even move. <laughs> right? <laughs> we go back to the studio. I couldn't even find my sticks. I was like, "Ah!" I grab the sticks. He goes, "Play me a drum solo. Play him a drum solo." He's like. That's really good. Let's go back, back to the bar. Boom, I had the gig. So wow. it's like, you got to be able to hang with them too, if you know what I mean. It's not a music audition. thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I brought down a thing called an octoband. Yes. But it was, a, I think it was a dragon drum in the old days. It was a, uh, acrylic, see-through, like Billy Cobham used. Yeah, yeah. So I got my dragon drum right when he meets me, right? We didn't even go to the bar yet. I got the drum in the hand. He's, look, he's, He's got like this um, 1970s mirrored shades on. And I could see he's looking at the drum. He's not really looking at my face. He's looking at the drum. I put the drum down. He comes running and does a flying leap kick with his cowboy boots. Boom. And he kicks my drum across the floor. The drum goes flying. I met this guy 20 minutes before. I go, what the hell are you doing? Dude, he goes, that drum is way too small to play on my album. I need big drums. <laughs> Oh, I need big drums. <laughs> oh, I, and that was that was the beginning, man. I'm I'm glad <laughs> all the stuff I hear about him is true. <laughs> he's brilliant though. Like he's allowed to get away with all the shit because he's a brilliant guitar player. Yeah. <laughs> Did you was it an enjoyable experience working with Ingray? On stage, it's amazing because dude, as a drummer, you would love it. He goes, We're John, I want to talk to you. You're thinking you're going to get fired or something? He goes, I think I want bigger fills, longer fills. He goes, uh, can you, is there such thing as like a two and a half measure fill? I go, yeah, I could give you a three measure fill. And he really was interested in shit like that. Yeah, yeah. Bigger fills. And then the drum solo, longer. I would fight. He's on a stage drinking. I guess his, <laughs> I don't know about it anymore. But he was like, longer drum solo. He would sit there with a beer going like this, play longer. <laughs> Like, okay. I mean, so yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. But it, on stage, it was amazing because it's like a drum experience. And I was a big fan. I had that first album when I was playing drums to records in my basement, you know? Yeah. So. He, he's an amazing talent, a ridiculous oh, talent. But you hear ridiculous. these stories. It's almost like a spoof thing, isn't it? But, but he lives up to it and good on oh, him, you know? It's all real. I don't know if you heard any of the records we did, but like the first record. Um, the Alchemy. Did you? Alchemy, exactly. Yeah. So why would anybody, do you know a producer uh, named Chris Tangredis? Yes, of course I do. Yes. I mean, me and Chris were really tight. Uh, on rest in peace, you know. Yes, but we, we went down to Criteria where they did Heaven and Hell, and the owner was there. And I said, "Where did they set up the drum kit for Heaven and Hell?" Hmm. He said, "Over there." Me and Chris took the drums. We set them right at the exact spot. Yeah. And I don't know. I forgot the story, but he was like a runner or a guy to go get the bagels. Mm -hmm. for Led Zeppelin wow. so he actually he actually saw the way they mic the drums at the time and we tried it and it just didn't work because it's John Bond it's not where you put the mics it's but we easy. tried it <laughs> exactly and that's important but Chris got the sound it was so brilliant and we were so psyched but in the middle of the record he quit because there was a battle between uh you know <laughs> and then um from then on the drum sound went south yeah. But if we put out that sound with Tangredis, it was brilliant, man. Mm. I mean, I was thinking, wow, you know. I mean, the the, the sound is is typical, as most uh, Malmsteen al albums, guitar is at the forefront, as you'd expect, you know, it's his <laughs> thing. Uh, everything else is kind of in the background a little bit. Yeah. But, but uh, Wield My Sword... I does love it. Have, does have a great drum intro, doesn't it? You know, so that's my favorite. That song. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's been been pretty uh, pretty giving, letting you have that, hasn't he? <laughs> well, he gave me the drum solo at the end. Yeah, we, of course. We went. I mean, the way that you know, um, Quantum Leap, the last song on the record. I thought he was going to keep like five measures and fade, but he left. It's like ten minutes long. I'm just soloing, and he let me go. And it's a rhythm. Because we went to a Mexican restaurant the day before we recorded that. Right. And we went to a Mexican restaurant called Paquitos. And he goes, this place is my favorite. They love me here. So we walk in. I saw the Marachi guys going, oh, no, 
thing where you can see like uh, <laughs> we go up and we're eating and um we start talking about Demiola actually. Ingve yeah. just grabs the guitar from the mariachi. He grabs one of the guitars and he starts he's experimenting and he's playing and the guy's going, I gotta go back to work. Bumps he's like, I'm Ingve Malmstein, I'm writing something. Wait a second. <laughs> so the mariachi guy split, and that's where he wrote dun dun digga 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 dun dun. So the next day in the studio, we used the riff and we did the drum solo over the whole thing. So it's cool because nothing's over till it's over. No, I mean, you know I mean? <laughs> amazing where you grab your influ your inspirations from, I should say, isn't it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, you know, an amazing character. And I, I love hearing the stories because it, it makes him him, doesn't it? You know, and hey, for a silly talent, whatever, a ridiculous off the charts it, talent. It, it, people don't know. Like, I don't know if it's OCD or like whatever they call it. It's one of these things he has. Rehearsal is about eight hours, but you don't play the songs. Right. You sit around and listen to Jerky Boys, or we sit and listen to music. He, he tells some stories. You drink beer, and uh, but I can't play and drink, so I'm waiting the whole time while everybody's just hanging out, swigging, telling jokes and stories. About the last hour or two, that's when he realizes, whoa, the day is getting, you know, and he says, let's go play. Come on, we got to play. And you play maybe a couple of Deep Purple songs. You don't really rehearse his shit right. until you hit the stage. Right. So I, th I, don't, I don't know if it's planned or not, but it keeps you on your toes. So the first real rehearsal is the first gig, and it makes everybody learn the stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, let's yeah, be honest, so, it's, not, it's not simple stuff, is it? Let's be honest. No. Not really. No, no. Well, and it has to be it has to be energetic and it has and two and a half hour shows, man. Yeah. A lot so. of punctuation in those fills and things and, and and yeah. Especially the three and a half measure ones. <laughs> <laughs> but look, you know, we, we we've we've talked pr progressive rock and we, we've talked thrash metal and we you know with TNT pretty much straight ahead rock slash metal. Yeah. Now um, a privilege for me was was hearing um, the War of the Worlds album, Michael Romeo, which to me, I, I, I just sets your playing apart from from uh, most other people. I think, uh, you know. It, Thank you. That I, I I'm not too familiar with the second one yet, but the it's first sick. One, it's much oh, better. It's sick. You're gonna freak. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for a chance where I can be in, in, uninterrupted and just listen to it. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's I've got a full week of gigs, so I'm hopeful on journeys. I'm gonna, but what an incredible album in every sense. Thank you, brother. Ah, uh, you know, um, fr from the sounds, from the songs, from the production, the drumming, it's just magnificent. That must have been incredible to record, because again, we're not talking straightforward here, are we? No, like um, Romeo is such a okay. When I did the Symphony X tour. Mm -hmm. We became great friends. Yeah. Me and the whole band. Symphony X are the nicest, coolest people. Yeah. And amazing players. So me and Romeo became great friends. And uh, he called me and he said, I want to do a solo album, but I want to make songs. It's not going to be like, uh, you know, he wants to make songs. So the way he did it with me was cool. He said, he, he loves my drumming. He wants to kind of write something around how he thinks he thinks I would play. And I'm thinking that could be good or maybe it's not so good because Malmsteen used to send demos and it was like an old uh, rolling drum machine or something and he would have the double bass button like brrr, and then he would click, brrr, play that. You know what I mean? But Romeo sent me the demo and what he does, he programs everything, yeah. right? In the way he thinks you would play it. Yeah. And then he says, just follow the kicks. Do whatever you want. Do you want to play your linear stuff between the kicks? Do that. You could play your bells. You could do your own fills. You want to do ghost notes on the snare? No. Michael Romeo hates ghost notes, which me and my engineer were laughing at. Well, what do you mean he hates ghost notes? He prefers the left hand on the high hand, which okay. is interesting. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so he says, um, as long as you keep my kick pattern, like that, 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 or something really similar, because that's the chunky chunky he's got to follow. Yeah. He said, the rest is written for you. So those these two albums, he he's a really brilliant musician. So he actually does program kind of like you would play it, mm. because he he is a drummer himself. It's not like he's got a tom connected with a bell of a ride and a snare drum and and a floor tom. You know what I mean? Yeah, not one right. of those programmers. <laughs> so so I got a little cocky. I went to uh, San Marino, which is a country inside of Italy. It's yeah. pretty much a mountain that has its own country, right? And that's where my buddy Simone Milodoni, the engineer, was. <laughs> and uh. <laughs> Mooney, 
So we went up to record. I brought my whole kid up there. Brilliant studio. The first two days, we do two songs for the first album. And we're psyched. And Romeo says, just send it to me at night. If there's any changes, I'll write the changes. You re-record the changes in the morning. Yeah. We, me and him, me and Simone were super psyched. Like, this is going to be easy. We send it to Romeo. The dude knocks on my hotel door like an hour early. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? He goes, we got a lot of recording to do. And I'm like, ha, 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 let's go get breakfast. I'm laughing. He goes, no, serious. Romeo wrote like a book of things to change. Oh. I go, no way. So we're thinking this is going to be a pain in the ass. As much as I love Romeo, this is going to be crazy. Is he going to change every little fill, like the power man thing? Especially, especially when, after we, giving you your, your free reign on it. Yeah, I'm like, oh, my God, man. And so we went to the studio, and I started to change things. And as it went on, the next day it got less and less and less. And by, like, the third day, it was like, he used the word spectacular. I said, what are you, Liza Minnelli? He says, like, this is spectacular. You know what I mean? So... <laughs> It, it got a lot simpler, and on the second album, he pretty much let me go. But he just said, if I'm going to do a triplet, don't play, you know, if I'm going to do 30-second notes, don't play like a half-note triplet thing. You know what I mean? Obvious things. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it was like, um, it's basically those albums are like Romeo kick patterns, but I'm big into linear drumming. Yeah. I have a linear drum book coming out. And linear with linear, pretty much, you could do anything between those beats so the beat remains the same as kind of the concept to my book but you could add melody and you could add counter rhythm between the notes yeah. so basically that's how it is to work with romeo he trusts me but the, the, the results are just outstanding in every i mean you, you must have been pleased with the production on that i love it i love it because it's real yeah i mean it, it, it's real i mean it, the dude we make samples we yeah. get my drum sound we play the whole album, and at the end, we sample everything I did down to like the slightest. Dum, dum. Next, dum, 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 dum. so when he mixes, he can use the exact drum sound we have, or he could put like with the arc thing, he could put that lipstick, that attack yeah. with the samples we have. So everything is real, and um, uh, it's very tight. But unfortunately, on that first album, there were some websites that were saying it was programmed and it was a drum machine. And to me, that was the biggest insult you could yeah. do because I'm like, I don't quantize. I play till it's right, you know, and I don't sample unless the producer wants it fully yeah. sampled. Yeah. So there was a couple of websites saying, I don't know why John Macaluso's name is here. It's all programmed. And I freaked out, man. I actually wrote to some of these guys like, what are you doing? What are you saying? Um, so I guess all those years playing on the click, it helped, but at the same time, yeah. they accused, they accused me. <laughs> I think, I think it's called a backhanded compliment. Yeah, maybe yeah. I, he didn't mean to insult me, but he was like, he said something like, uh, it's impossible, but maybe that's the new generation. And maybe they think it is me and you are used to doing that mm. being on the click. I mean, right. Well, I'd, I'd like to think so, yeah. I'll try. I'll try. Maybe not to the same extent that you do, you know. But, uh, but hey, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting stuck into part two this week. And, but just phenomenal. And, and it got me to thinking, um, obviously, uh, part one was 2018, just pre-COVID, wasn't it? Um, yeah, wow. And when, when Mike Portnoy left Dream Theatre, were you, was there any consideration for you? In, for that gig it's funny because i toured with james i did i did his first solo tour elements of persuasion what well, was and that was that pre uh mike man mangini mangini or was that was that no the, mangini did two albums called mole muzzler whatever that means yeah and uh and then he did elements of persuasion but he got the job at berkeley right so he had to teach at berkeley so when james had to do this tour yeah. um james um uh, Mangini couldn't do it. So yeah. I was at the NAMM show. I, I knew Portnoy for a while because we're both from New York. Yeah. And uh, I saw him at the NAMM show and I was, he's like, what are you doing? How's Ark and everything? And because um, Portnoy liked Ark. He actually, yeah. he actually um, paid a salvation on Ark where his two favorite albums of the year way back. So wow. we flew to France and we did like this dream theater convention where it was just like a, it was like a Star Trek convention. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't, nobody was playing us and pain of salvation played. So, so I knew Mike 
Yeah. And I was at the NAMM show. He said, what are you doing? I said, pretty much nothing. He goes, you need a gig. Um, I think James is looking for someone. Right. So I went home and I landed and I checked my phone and LeBrie called, like when I was on the flight. You know what I mean? And he said, uh, you know, he knows me from Almstein and Ark and I don't want to do a solo tour. So I did the solo tour. It was a killer band. Marcus Foley on guitar, mm. me on drums, um, and James. It, it was a killer band. And we got along. But the funny thing is, when Portnoy quit is right when I tried to start Ark again. And the uh, reason I'm here, the reason I'm here in Europe, because I moved to Sweden. Right. I sold everything to start Ark again. So that was my focus. I said, I just sold my car. I left my house, everything. I'm living in Sweden. I'm, I'm here for Ark. That was the plan. Because a lot of people writing me, do Dream Theater. You got to get it. You got to get it. But honestly, I never listened to Dream Theater. No. So it would have been a nightmare for me because I didn't even, I knew Pull Me Under. And so I, I never bought an album. Like I, I was not really a, a Dream Theater fan. Mm. So mo there was, I could have learned it, but I, it would have been, a gig like that is not easy to jump into. No. But because you're not you're not the original guy and i knew you know i was almost dreading getting a call if it makes sense yeah you know what i mean <laughs> but if ever if ever a drummer is made for that gig it's you for you know from from my humble ears if you like um th there's nothing in there that you you wouldn't eat for breakfast if you like um, no, I would have played the shit out of it. Now I'm thinking, man, you know, because Ark ended up breaking up. Yeah. <laughs> I think a couple of weeks later again. Yeah, but I mean, um, I mean, we've all seen the audition uh, tapes, which were well, publicly put out, and and there's a few drummers, obviously, who weren't who were there just for the sake of being there for a TV program, weren't there? I think, but yeah, <laughs> you you just. I I I I was I was just thinking while I while I was listening to the Michael Romeo album, and I was just thinking, this has got just you know. But hey, you know, I got I, I talked to James actually because he said some people were recommending me, and it's funny. I was so new to the internet, mm. and at, at the time when this happened, where um, what happened again? My views started to go up on my YouTube like overnight. I'm like, yeah. what did I do? Commit a crime? What the hell did I do last night? It was like you know twenty thousand, and it was like forty thousand in one night. What the hell's happened here? There was an interview with Labrie, the first interview that ever happened after the Portnoy thing. And I knew the journalist. So the journalist said, can I recommend John Macaluso to you? Mm. And he says, I know John, he did my solo tour. He's a great drummer. I can't tell you if he's one of the seven drummers. Right. So maybe people presumed, and a lot of them never even heard of me at Check the time, of course. Yeah, like, who's this guy? So they were checking out who this guy was supposed to be. No, who he wasn't, it was me. But uh, no, I never actually went down and auditioned for him, no. Ah, that's a... Hey, but as you say, you know, you had other things on your mind at the time, but you'd have been the perfect fit. Thanks, I, man. I've got either, my humble opinion, of course, but... Uh, yeah, they're all, they're all monster players, man. They're oh, monster players. No question. As, as, as both, both mics, both fabulous, you know, but uh, uh, equally yourself. Um, Thank you, brother. That's Thank my you. view, anyway. Hey, you're going to love this, man. Like the Yngwie album, Alchemy, the last song is a drum solo. The yeah. same, with, same with Romeo. Really? Dude, he, on the new album. It's it's called uh, Alien Death Ray. Of course. <laughs> and he wrote it, he said he wrote it with me in mind. He said he wanted to mix like Stravinsky and uh, the kicks, not Dave Wecker, but like the kicks you would hear Dave Wecker do with Chick Corea. Da, 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 da. So he kind of put those two ideas together and he wrote this thing and he's like, this is your piece, do it. And I did it on the first album, but he didn't put it on the first album. I wanted to kill him. I'm like, dude, what about Alien Death Ray? So he put it on the second album, and it's the last track on the on the bonus track edition. Right. There's like a there's a there's a, um one of the albums has two extra tracks. Right. So it's Alien Death Ray. It's the last track, and it's sick, brother. <laughs> I'm gonna look. For, I'm gonna look forward to, uh, to listening to that. This week is the week. I'll I'll, I'll drop you a little message and and, and let, let you Please. know my thoughts. <laughs> I need I need your review, man. I need your review. <laughs> look, John, this has been an absolute. Play. Yeah, you're great. Oh, hey, you're great. Me. You know, you're the man here, and and um, absolute, honestly, so enjoyable. Thanks so much Thank for you. your time. It's Same been, here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, John. Thank you, my friend. We Thank keep you. in touch. Take care, my man. Thanks, mate. Bye-bye.